So um, for people who are saying, okay, you know, I don't want to have diabetes, I don't want to be sick, I'm going to eat healthy, do everything you're recommending, and I have big salads, I, I, don't, I barely put that much cheese, I just sprinkle a little, I just sprinkle cheese on my salads. Is that such a big deal? I mean, is cheese, is dairy, you know, as long as you're not going crazy, can you make dairy, just putting cheese in your salads, a part of your diet and still be living very close to optimal? I, I've written an, a series of different books exposing different so-called foods, or what we perceive as foods. One is called Dairy Deception. In there, I reference study after study on diabetes being caused by milk and cheese and yogurt, and the list goes on and on. Greek yogurt and kefir and all the things that the health stores promote as healthy food. I've written a book on fish. I reference study after study after study on diabetes and fish, and Gabriel just added something that I didn't add in that book because it's new research. And so it's killing 100% of certain kinds of cells. And I wouldn't be surprised with what we find in fish today, not only the rancid oil that's called the lipid peroxide that causes heart attacks and cancer, by the way. Not maybe, definitely lipid peroxides do that. I've written a book on poultry, my latest book, called Poison Poultry. And by the way, in that I reference study after study after study on how poultry, poultry happens to be, so we don't call it a name, it's a chicken. Where most of you think, chicken, ah, oh, chicken's good, it's an organic chicken. Organic chicken will give you diabetes. Turkey, give you more diabetes than chicken. So those of you that say, I don't eat hamburgers, I eat turkey burgers. Well, you want diabetes? Great, keep eating turkey burgers. <laughs> Duck, I showed you there's a rare form of cancer until I studied for that book. I didn't know. AHH, a rare form of cancer you get from duck? I didn't even know that. It causes diabetes. And so the list goes on. And, you know, what we have to do is educate, as I think Brenda said it so eloquently and correctly, I'm pro having round tables. Gabriel sat at round tables with me. I'm pro at bringing people in from every single discipline in healthcare and not saying one's right and one's wrong. We're all having something we can contribute. I'm not a medical doctor doing particular work in a certain area. We need that woman or man at that table. And we all have to sit and share experiences. When do we get back to the patient again? When do we talk, why doesn't the patient sit in the middle of that round table and we say, okay, leave your ego at the door. Leave the economic concerns at the door. What can you do as a doctor or as a psychologist? Uh, Gabriel happens to be a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. What can you do? And then we bring in somebody, an exercise physiologist. Let's bring Dr. Kenneth Cooper in there. What can you do for diabetes? And why aren't we doing that? Everyone's out there yelling and screaming getting everyone riled up, you're more confused than you've ever been because more of us are talking than we ever have, and the truth of the matter is, this is easy stuff. Matter of fact, diabetes, as Anna Marie said, if you don't reverse diabetes, shame on you. But the truth of the matter is, I think 80% of cancers can be reversed. Not maybe, I think so. Why? Because I've seen these things happen. Heart disease, another brain-dead, easy thing to do. I mean, heart disease isn't a disease. There is a few people that have bowel problems. That's a disease. But when you're sitting on your butt and you're stressed and you're eating all of this nonsense and you have a bad marriage and you hate your job and you don't have connection with God, guess what? You're going to have a heart attack because you probably prefer being dead at that point. <laughs> so that's why people have heart attacks. And, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And new disease, you know, not new disease. I see things like multiple sclerosis. They were rare. Now they're going like this. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, going like this. Parkinson's, going like this. Why is that happening? Because we're more polluted, we're more sick, we're more consuming things that we should never have consumed, loaded with stuff that we should never have put into it, and being ill-educated. It's easier to go with the status quo we believe. No, it's easier to do the right thing. And a couple of other things about dairy, and I know Dr. Cousins also alluded to this, well, not alluded, you talked about this in your, <laughs> in your uh, uh, presentation, but um, it, with type 1 diabetes and dairy, I mean, of course we know dairy is full of saturated fat and all sorts of things, that dioxins and so on, but, but um, what many people not, may not be aware of is that uh, dairy products also contain um, a protein called beta casomorphin 7, and there are different types of cows that produce different types of, of this compound. 
some of which seem to be linked to increased risk of type 1 diabetes in children. There's another compound called Mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis, or MAP, that um, is found in dairy products. And in fact, 95% of the large dairies with 500 plus cattle, uh, uh, cows, uh, actually the, the milk was contaminated with MAP. Pastor, um, pasteurization kills a lot of it, but even with pasteurization, you've got about 2.8% of the samples uh, were found still to have MAP. And there's a, a kind of a, a genetic, um, uh, I guess a, a genetic uh, mutation. mutation, yeah, that makes children who are exposed to those much more apt to develop this autoimmune disease in which they'll attack their own beta cells. And so there are these things that are associated with dairy as well that deserve some consideration. So I w wanna add to what everybody's saying is that part of my work is out in the rest of the world where there's a whole lot less resistance to the obvious. Now the reason is we're not generations away from returning to the natural way of living. So when I'm in Africa, South America, different places, it's, we have programs where we're, we don't involve the medical community at all because they have the least amount of understanding, really in the big picture, but really are training people to be, let's say, uh, diabetes prevention uh, educators. And they're, they're local community people they're educated and then they're taking people's blood sugars and giving them advice. It's not that hard. How do you just go back to the natural ways? Not complicated. So that's what we're doing and we're not involving it. Now what's happening is some of the hospitals, some of the doctors are getting interested as referral points, but they're opening up to the idea that this is such a big problem, such an epidemic problem, it's way beyond the medical world. It really has to do with person to person and groups. There are some governments that are considering kind of making it a national program. It's very, for a variety of reasons. Plus, it's very expensive to treat diabetics. It's very expensive. So we have, at the governmental level, a lot of people are getting more and more open to developing national programs that is a win-win for everybody. It protects the health, but also protects the finances of that country. If you follow the diabetes costs, they will bankrupt all the nations because it's like 13% now and it's very expensive, but it keeps going up. So government officials outside of the organized medical type situations where they have vested interest, as Brian's talking about, they're a lot more open to just giving people the basics. Let's cut out the soft drinks, let's cut out the sugar, and go back to their natural way. So that's how I'm approaching it, literally, ar literally around the world. 17 programs in 11 different nations. So we can get around this. We don't need the medical community at all, really. Mm -hmm.